LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Months, he creates a revolutionary type of microprocessor. In three years, Cyberten will become the largest supplier of military computer systems. All stealth bombers are upgraded with Cyberten computers, becoming fully unmanned. Afterwards, they fly with a perfect operational record. The Skynet funding bill is passed. The system goes online on August 4, 1997. Human decisions are removed from strategic defense. Skynet begins to learn at a geometric rate. It becomes self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Eastern Time, August 29th. In a panic, they try to pull the plug. Skynet fights back. Yes, it launches its missiles against the targets in Russia. Because Skynet knows that the Russian counterattack will eliminate its enemies over here. Let me put it this way, Mr. Amer. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error. The first law is as follows. A robot may not harm a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey orders given it by qualified personnel unless those orders violate rule number one. Uh, rule number three, a robot must protect its own existence unless that violates rules one or two. A robot must cheerfully go into self-destruction if it is in order to follow an order or to save a human life. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Hal, I won't argue with you anymore. Open the doors. Dave, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Hal? 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 In talking to the computer, one gets the sense that he is capable of emotional responses. We are for you would be assimilated. We are walk. Lower your shields and surrender your ships. Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Antonin Toynman who joins us to discuss his book Is Intelligence an Algorithm? A wide-ranging exploration of the similarities and differences between human and artificial intelligence and the potential for future advancement of both. Although human and machine intelligence share certain similarities, there are profound differences which pose significant problems for the development of an artificial intelligence which can truly match or even exceed the capabilities of the human brain. Artificial intelligence seeks to emulate the strengths of human intelligence whilst eliminating its weaknesses. However, both human flaws and human genius stem from the same source and it seems that we cannot have one without the other. Among other things, this places the prospects for transhumanist hopes of merging man and machine in serious doubt. 
There is also the question of whether artificial intelligence can ever truly understand the information it processes. Even the most powerful computers today are still essentially number crunchers with a limited capacity for pattern recognition. Meaning and purpose are alien to AI, as are beliefs, emotions, desires, intuition, morals, and a host of other human characteristics and qualities. Consciousness is an unfathomable mystery even to us, so it seems that our attempts to replicate it in machines are doomed to failure. However, whatever the apparent limitations of artificial intelligence, computers are increasingly being placed in charge of the infrastructure and systems on which modern life depends. This poses difficult questions about what might happen should AI somehow evolve on its own. The so-called Internet of Things is linking computer power with sensors, robots and other machines at a rate which may become exponential. This cybernetic matrix is being given the power to control, to regulate, to decide, to act. What if it calculates that we are the problem? Many human beings have already come to this conclusion. Man, machine or something in between. To whom or what does the future belong? Hello and welcome, Antonin, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you. I'm really excited about this uh, interview. Thank you for uh, interviewing me about my book. Okay, Antonin. Now, today, you just mentioned we're going to be talking about your book, Is Intelligence an Algorithm? So perhaps just to get us started, you could let us know about the development of the book, why you wrote it, and just from your perspective, briefly, when we say intelligence here, what we're talking about, just a brief definition. Sure, no problem. So um, the reason why I wrote it is that uh, I've been working as a patent examiner for many years now uh, in the technical field of clinical diagnostics. And I discovered that there is a kind of pattern which links the way that uh, we humans think, reason uh, and cognize things to the way that evolution uh, generates complexity in nature. And I thought this was really something interesting, and I thought I need to inform the world about this this insight. And uh, I also realized that if the steps that I have found out that generate complexity uh, can be uh, put in practice in our daily life, it can actually improve our mental performance or any type of uh, performance. And uh, so my definition of in intelligence, which I use in the book, is is not my own uh, definition. It's a definition which was given by Ben Gertzel, and it's the, the ability to generate complexity. And... This is, of course, a, a very broad definition and not a definition which you would immediately think of because when we are thinking about intelligence, we usually think about the ability to understand things, the ability to solve problems, the ability uh, to, to put things together. But uh, that's all mental activities. But in fact, in nature... These things also happen uh, when evolution is creating uh, solutions to problems without having a real mind doing this. So Ben Gertzel used this definition for a reason because you are not limited to uh, human mental uh, thought only, but you can also use it for artificial systems like the artificial intelligence that is being developed and as well as for processes taking place in nature. So that's why in this book I adopt a very broad definition of intelligence. Well, yeah, your book is very interesting in that it's at least two books in one. Uh, you talk a lot about uh, human intelligence and also about potential for artificial intelligence, and you're trying to look at ways uh, to sort of improve both. So it's sort of um, half self-development book and half futurist sort of speculation but essentially as i say it's ways to improve both human mental health and you know intelligence and also talking about the, the potential for artificial intelligence where that can go and a lot of you make a lot of comparisons between the two and feel i think that one can learn from the other as it were absolutely absolutely it's a, a feedback uh, system and uh, uh, in fact when we are designing AI, we look at the way 
we are doing things. And when we are writing algorithms, we write them as recipes because we as humans would take those steps when we would be solving such a problem. So AI is modeled after the human intellect, but the human intellect can also learn from the developments in AI. And that creates indeed a kind of uh, circle loop that it works in both directions. Now, talking about human intelligence, when you mentioned natural intelligence, what goes on in nature with the evolution, it seems to be like an inherent intelligence at work there. I mean, some people maintain that, uh, you know, evolution is sort of a blind process, that everything is random and anything that comes of it that appears in patterns and design is purely accidental. I've never been convinced about that. But in any event, in any event, you point out uh, the similarity in certain structures and systems to neural networks. For example, structures from the micro to the macro, how they can resemble each other and have these similarities in nature. Uh, everything from microscopic life, bacterial uh, communities through to branches and leaves, trees, right up to the structure of galaxies, mm-hmm. often mirroring the structure uh, in neural networks in the human brain itself. Yes, that's very true. And, and, and the fact that we see over so many scales uh, a recurrent pattern of, of networks makes that networks, and especially neural uh, networks, are a kind of the, the ultimate metaphor. Uh, every Let's say every generation has its own metaphor and and in the the times of the 19th century with the the steamboats, uh, thermodynamics was the the, the preferred metaphor and everything was, uh, let's say, expressed in that way. And and in the last century, uh, the the later part, everything was expressed in terms of, of computing and computers. But we are now coming to the insight that the ultimate metaphor might rather be networks, neural networks and and cybernetic uh, feedback loops therein. So you see them indeed at every scale. And if that's true, that then the the, the concept of mindness may not be confined to the human mind alone, but there may be a mind at large and there may be a mind in the micro as well. Yes, as you say, that period where it was fashionable to think of the human brain in computing terms um, that was always a bit of a ill fit, wasn't it? It never quite worked. It, you know, there wasn't a direct correlation. And I think that thinking about that in that way for too long, we ca- kind of had to get past that in order to, you know, get to some of the developments in AI where we are now. Um, and so I think that way of thinking was too simplistic. Indeed. And, and AI has been developing towards the neural networking more and more in the, the last decades and, and, the simple normal algorithms uh, don't suffice anymore. Well, they are okay if you have specific tasks and you have a specific goal where you want to go to, but for things like doing pattern recognition, which is one of the, well, the biggest branch of uh, AI, uh, you need these neural networks, which are, let's say, loosely uh, modeled after human brains, but but not entirely. They are highly simplified uh, models thereof, in fact. Now, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, we're probably going to bounce between talking about human thinking and AI thinking, quote-unquote, where that might take us. In the section of your book where you're talking about how we as humans think, how we process information, how we decode our environment, solve problems, etc etc there's a section where you talk about different types of thinking when we're trying to work out what it is we're seeing and what it is what's around us deductive thinking inductive thinking and abductive now funnily enough i was reading another book quite recently and it was the first time i mean i knew about deductive thinking and how that wasn't the only way to go about it and how quite often we employ other modes of thinking which lead us down blind alleys and wrong conclusions but it was interesting that i came across these three modes of thinking just a couple of weeks before I got your book and there it was again. So perhaps we could say a little bit about that because a lot of what goes on in the world, and this is really important actually, a lot of the problems in the world, a lot of the conflict, a lot of the strife, personal, political, institutional, global, at every level is because of flawed thinking, logical fallacies and other problems. Indeed, uh, logical fallacies are, are the, the key word here and, and people often jump too quickly to conclusions uh, without having gone through the, the laws of logic. And if you follow the laws of logic, there are indeed these three modes. 
And what these modes all have in common is that they compare specific instances to general rules. And the deductive modes start from uh, a, a general rule, which is a given in the deductive system. So, for instance, uh, in, in the deductive uh, system, you can have the rule that all men are mortal. And then there is the specific instance of Socrates as a man. And then you can come to the conclusion that Socrates, as he is a man, must be mortal too. So that's deductive reasoning. But deductive reasoning has a premise, and the premise is this general rule. But who says that that general rule is is always true? Because general rules, we derive them from observation, from experience, and that's actually where inductive reasoning comes. Because we see the sun come up every day, at a certain moment we realize, well then probably it will rise again tomorrow. And that's how we gather our uh, inductive notions. And so every deductive set of reasoning has an inductive premise at its start. And uh, people often forget that. And, and they speak about truth and especially uh, religious people always speak about the truth. And Truth is, of course, uh, a difficult subject, and it can also be relative. And uh, if you jump too easily to a conclusion that something is always true in all instances, well, you you haven't observed the instance that will take place tomorrow yet. So how can you be so sure that it will be the same? It's it's just a high probability that it will be like that. And that's one flaw of reasoning that because people have started to believe so strong in this deductive reasoning that they believe that truths will always be the same and always be true. But there is no guarantee for that, certainly not from a scientific point of view. And this is interesting because the scientific method, when we go back to the time of the Greeks and the Romans, was the deductive method. And they tried... uh, Aristotle and, and Plato, they, they try to come up with a whole uh, worldview and an understanding of the world by deductive reasoning. Now, deductive reasoning is fine if you start from mathematics, because in mathematics, uh, it's, it's, it's a black and white system of rules, and the rules are true per se because they have been defined as such. But when we are dealing with things taking place in the real world, We can only know rules by observation. And this is where uh, this difficulty arises. And so I would say that science has different modes of working. And there's this deductive mode, which indeed starts from mathematical premises. And in physics, they try to apply it with string theory, for instance. And they try to derive a necessity that particles and objects must behave in a certain way because mathematically it should be so. Um, But most observations that we do have a little bit more of leeway and and do not always confirm to a deductive or mathematical mode. Uh, And especially quantum mechanics has shown that our mechanical way of thinking that was rooted in the the uh, 16th, 17th century with uh, Descartes and Newton and others, uh, that that is no longer true. And that one of the the famous saying in quantum mechanics is, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So, in fact, where is certainty? And there is also this Heisenberg uncertainty relation. If you try to measure the speed of a particle, you can't know where it is. And if you know exactly where it is, you can't know anything about its speed. So this makes that you can only look at certain aspects of reality, but you can't, you can never grasp reality as a whole. So this leaves us with a difficulty to determine what is the absolute truth. Well, from our perspective, there can't be an absolute truth. There can only be local truths. There can be shared truths, consensus truths. Uh, but absolute truths is a, is a concept 
which came from uh, the the antiquity, and, and we should get rid of this notion of absolute truth because it's it's divisive and it creates problems between human beings, and it's often based on on logical fallacies and beliefs that things must necessarily be so, whereas there is absolutely no grounding or foundation for it to be so. And of course, there are many logical fallacies and and, and people. Uh, use in, in political arguments they they often use the weaknesses of the 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 human emotions to get their argument across so they they attack people on their personal uh opinions on their personal behavior uh, this is to call the ad hominem fallacy and of course this is not a this is not a fair way of approaching it's not an objective way of approaching the problem which is being discussed because it's it's not about the problem. They try to take somebody off guard and, and corner him, whereas the, the topic which is being discussed is no longer on the table. So this is very unfortunate, of course, but if once we come we become aware of, of such uh, malicious behavior, we can also defend ourselves and, and build armor to and to know when we are cornered and, and how not to jump into that trap, how not to jump into a trap of vanity. Recently, somebody who had read my book tried to corner me and he said, well, an intelligent guy like you should know that this and this and this. And he was basically playing on my vanity. And and I didn't want to take the bait because I know I, I realized, hey, he wants me to go in his direction by by stating that I should be intelligent and therefore it would be logical to follow his conclusions. No, I should stay objective and make up my own mind and not go into this vanity trap and, and say, well, whatever you think, it's, it's irrelevant. Let's consider the facts and not go into uh, my personal state of mind. Yes, well, when you point out, for example, when people are employing ad hominem attacks, what quite often happens is that you then get ad hominem attacks against yourself for doing so. But there's a couple of things here that are really important. Uh, they highlight differences between human and machine intelligence in that we, taking the subjectivity that you talked about, which in a way is kind of all we've got, you know, reality is subjective. There isn't that you know, the absolute truth that we can divine uh, as things stand. That said, we also have this craving for certainty. That's a big problem, I think, is that people want to know what the answer is. They want to know what the situation is. They want to know what they're dealing with. And so that they will definitely respond to people who say, I have the answer. I know what to do. I know how it is. I have the truth. And when you roll into our thinking, things that machines don't have, uh, you know, beliefs, emotions, you know, love, hate, fear, all of that, any concept of morality, which is totally subjective. Uh, well, there's large areas of agreement you know but it's still subjective and then it also functions like intuition that we have that we don't well understand so it makes for an endlessly complex picture and i say the world that we're in right now is one that's quite dumbed down and wants simple straightforward answers and it wants them now actually yeah yeah and that's also culturally determined huh? because uh uh Different cultures have different approaches and the older a culture is, the more is implicit and, and hidden in, in what is uh, spoken out. But uh, as, let's say, and I don't want to uh, say this in a negative way about the United States, but the United States is more or less the, the trendsetter in, in, in how people should think and should behave huh, in this world more or less and it's it's a fairly young society uh, it's a it's a society uh, which has been around only for a couple of hundred years and um, if you look at very old societies like the Chinese or the Japanese society there's a lot of implicit information going on there but Americans want to have uh, information very explicit very short and very to the point and uh, society has, uh, is, is, is now, yeah, being funneled in that direction of being extremely explicit and, and 
to the point and short and and it also has a, a kind of dumbing down effect there are advantages to it but there are also disadvantages that the, the richness of a culture the depth of, of information transmission in in ways people uh, have their uh, behave and and uh, let's say body signs uh, body language things like that they are often missed yeah, I have had communications from listeners, not not majority by any means, but you know some over the years that uh, I need to stop having these long discussions because people don't want this. You know, I should be doing no more than fifteen minutes, and preferably I should be doing like two minutes. Just get to the point. You know, tell us what this is about because we've got to get on to something else. I've got no intention of doing that, but nonetheless, it's, it's, there's a demand for it, no doubt. Yeah, it's a little bit of pity, and 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 uh, especially in in Southern European uh, cultures, there's more the anecdotal mode of operating. You first tell a, a couple of anecdotes, and you try more or less subliminally to get your message across without pointing all too literally to it. And um, the culture has been developing, especially in the northwest of Europe and and the U.S towards a culture which is extremely explicit and doesn't take the time for the little anecdotes which make life worthwhile, which make it, it fun to hear a uh, story. So they they want everything uh, in black and white and in an abstracted form. Huh? So there is the richness of the, the concrete, um, let's say, pictorial uh, values uh, that you could sketch. And there, there is the poorness of, of the black and white, uh, rigid, uh, pu- uh, bringing everything down to an abstracted glyph or something. Yeah, I know in some cultures it's considered to be quite rude if you want to just get down to business straight away. I, I come from Ireland and there's a, you know, a tradition of doing exactly what you described a moment ago, just a little bit of, oh, well, you know, let's talk about the weather or something, you know, or, you know, how's your sister or whatever it happens to be, you know, and, you know, and then you work your way around to things. You're kind of sizing someone up. And I've got a colleague from the Netherlands and he makes me laugh because there's just none of that at all. And he's so, he can be so blunt. You know, I'll be, yeah, yeah. I've said things to him before and like that, that I thought were funny, but were kind of beside the point. You know, there was no purpose. There was no value in what I was saying, really. It was just sort of like you know, an anecdote, just nonsense, really. And he just looks yeah, up, yeah. he just looks at me like, said, just blank, just like, you know, why are you saying this? You know? <laughs> yeah. He, he didn't get the, the relevance of uh, the topic. And uh, <laughs> of course, for this, it's, it's very useful to, to have lived in, in, in different cultures and, uh, I myself, I'm, I'm half Dutch, I'm half Spanish, so I, I also have uh, uh, got the, the Spanish side with me and, and I worked for a number of years in France. So I, I learned a little bit about the, the Southern European style of, of being, which is quite different than the Northwest European style of being. And, and the Dutch are rather extreme indeed. They, they are not so much into the, the small talk and, and uh, preparing the terrain for the, the real discussion to take place. Yeah, I think a lot of diplomats are supposed to be good at all this, but I think a lot of the high-level political discussion we see in the world, I think a lot of these people could learn a, a lot. Or they have a lot to learn, shall I say, about taking these things into account. Um, we'll come back to talking about human intelligence and thinking shortly, but let's just turn to the, the machine part of your book, uh, your speculations about AI. You may have noticed if you looked at my website, but I'll make no secret about the fact that I'm a skeptic, shall we say, when it comes to some of the promise of AI. I remain to be convinced about a lot of things, but I do look at it closely. Uh, let's just generally say that obviously uh, computers excel at certain tasks. One of the reasons we found them so useful, initially it was number crunching, but they're just, you know, and, or analytical things, jobs that humans find boring uh, and that we can't do particularly quickly. Computers have been a uh, godsend, really, uh, and they lack the subjective human qualities that we talked about earlier, you know, morals and emotion and intuition and these various things. That is a disadvantage in some ways, uh, especially thinking about future development of AI. It's also an advantage because, you know, why do we want to bring emotion or morals into um, adding and subtracting? They also have this thing, this is one of the boundaries we're at at the minute, is that computers don't understand in many, many ways that, you know, they don't have a concept of the meaning of the information that they're working with. Um, but we're forging ahead with future anyway, and lots of people, futurists, are, are working in these areas to try and take 
AI to the next level where it begins to take on the best of these qualities so it can become something other just than a, in some ways a sort of a dumb intelligence? Yeah, yeah, it, it is a mimic of intelligence. Huh? It, it's not a, a real intelligence in a certain way because it, it's not generating any complexity itself. It, it generates what we put in there. But nowadays, of course, with the developments of these neural networks, which are still very, very simple, uh, it starts to look more a little bit like a, a brain. And that, of course, brings uh, some other parameters into the question. But we should realize that even these neural networks, at the most basic level, they are programmed as algorithms. It's it's all just zeros and ones. It's not uh, some artificial type of, of neuron, which is made of, uh, let's say, uh, special polymers, uh, special plastics and special metals. No, it's, it, that's not the case. When we are speaking about a neuro, an artificial neural network, it's, 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 it's a program. But it's a program that behaves in a very unprogram-like fashion because it it more or less adapts itself. Uh, it 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 puts certain values to certain nodes, what are called nodes, and these nodes are connected. And by adapting these values gradually, it starts to recognize certain patterns. So it's very important in pattern recognition. But what is happening in the computer is just shifting of digits, zeros becoming ones and ones become zero. And, and I must agree with you, I can't see how zeros and one flipping, how that ever could become consciousness and know what it is doing. Because where is the integration of all that information? It's not there in an integrated manner. So it's there in an integrated manner for us when we look on the monitor. But the computer doesn't know that. He doesn't have a kind of mental inner eye with which it sees that. And, and we humans, we do have that. There is, of course, a very small group of humans who have a disease called aphantasia. They don't have an inner mental eye, so they can't see in their mind's eye what they are thinking of. But, but normal people, they can picture in their mind what they are thinking of. So they have an, an internal visual experience of what they are thinking and, and, and that's how they can become conscious of it and, and in a computer there is no such thing so I, I totally agree with you with your skepticism that it will be very difficult for computers to understand what they are doing because the let's say the, the von Neumann computer architecture which is based on, on digital uh, uh, flipping huh, the Turing computers they don't have the means to ever become understanding in my understanding. That's at least my hypothesis. Other, other people may think differently about that. Um, I remember reading Peter Russell's book, Global Brain, back in the 80s, and that was anticipating some of the developments that uh, have come to pass and some that have not yet but are still much talked about, and some of which you mentioned in your book and we've certainly seen in networks the uh, the capabilities of individual nodes are outstripped by the overall network such that you know it's greater than the sum of its parts the network is and we can see that to some extent with the internet you know all sorts of other things some of which we anticipated some of which we didn't or couldn't seem to be happening f- phenomena byproducts side effects of putting all this information together, networking it in an, in an unplanned way. Things seem to be happening that are very interesting potential developments. Well, indeed, the, the internet is is wiring up to become a kind of a network mind-like structure. And, and this is where I, I wrote a chapter about in my book called The Architecture of a Global Web Mind. Because as you say, indeed, it's wiring up in a non-programmed like fashion. And there is nobody who uh, decided uh, in a central manner what way it, it it should be organized. So it's it's more like a tumor spreading in all kinds of directions and with all kinds of uh, variegations and differentiations than uh, a structured process which will give rise to a, a, a structured stratified intelligence which with different levels and and this is also one of the reasons why i think that 
uh, the internet will not of itself ever become consciousness or understanding. But in my book, I came up with the idea of uh, putting in a kind of architecture to put in stratifications and layers and uh, to do this in an integrated manner so that information can be filtered out because that's what our brains do. They filter out information. We have so such an overload of information and actually we uh, we only distill a very minute amount of that information to become aware of, to become the essence of what we experience. And all the rest is just filtered out. So I describe in my book how we could build a kind of monitoring of the internet system uh, where every website is basically organized in a hierarchical, hierarchical uh, classification system. And every time information moves from one level to the next, only the most important points are guard uh, are kept and then moved on to the next level if a certain threshold is, threshold is met. So in this way, you can make that uh, it becomes a, a kind of pyramidal system where information goes from uh, a tremendous plethora of, of all kinds of nonsense to essences of important information that the system should be aware of for its own functioning and well-being. And in that sense, I mean not only the functioning and the well-being of the system, but the functioning and the well-being of humanity as a whole. So the system could be used to monitor whether tsunamis are occurring, where riots are occurring, uh, whether problems are arising, and, and it could allocate resources to deal with those problems. And, and in such a way, a kind of global web mind, which is a little bit more than uh, a random set of aggregates of yeah, information processing uh, modules would arise. Absolutely. And as you've basically pointed out, we don't need full AI as in envisaged by some people like Ray Kurzweil, for example, in order to have computer networks managing and controlling systems. I mean, we've got that already. Developments along those lines can continue. So maybe we'll look at some of the issues surrounding that. In the book you talk about, I mentioned earlier about, you know, humans have emotions and lots of other qualities that computers don't have. And you point out about uh, a lot of people couch that fact in negative terms. That is to say, human emotions are basically, they're necessary and they're just, they just are, but that we should, we need to master them and they're the source of a lot of problems, which they are. And the fact that computers don't have emotions is one of their great strengths. But you point out how the, you know, the evolution of where emotions come from, what their function actually was. And they're basically like some sort of warnings in the system that an optimum balance was, you know, was not achieved. Be like a warning light to say that we need to do something. Arguably, we've, you know, evolved out of the necessity of, of a lot of the extreme emotions that we still have. But would they then, if we try to introduce that into a computer system, it would basically end up being like dashboard lights. As I just mentioned, they would be sort of inhibitors a little bit like Asimov's laws of robotics or something about something in the system is not optimal. You need to do something about it. And that would mimic not the human emotions that we that we experience, you and I and everyone else, but the original function, which is just to say so, something here that needs your attention. Exactly, exactly. And, and this, this monitoring uh, function uh, makes that such a ability you could call artificial emotions. And of course, to us, they don't look like emotions. But as you to say, in essence, they, they are the, the mirror image of what uh, emotions are in humans. And, and they have this function of, of uh, notifying us that something might be wrong and that something has to be done in order to overcome a, a potential problem. If we have, in the future, uh, increasingly large computer systems or complex advanced computer systems running things, we have some potential problems in that, as we alluded to earlier, how can the system determine important things like what's true and false? Uh, you know, for example, if someone is lying, you know, we think of films like Minority Report now, and you mentioned in your book, the film Eagle Eye and the TV series Person of Interest. There's the problems that occur there are because of this, the, the amb ambiguity in human thinking and, and being that doesn't exist in the black and white zero and one world 
of computers. So there's a lot of potential problems there. And of course, we have to think also about the intent of the creators of the AI, because after all, it's the old um, Geigo adage, isn't it? Garbage in, garbage out. Um, whoever designs the system, what is their intent? What's their purpose? What are their emotions when they were creating the, the system? Yeah, and you can absolutely, you can uh, certainly de- design AI systems with uh, malicious uh, purposes. And also all developments which uh, are interesting for the good guys, they are equally interesting for the, the bad guys. So every good intent can also be employed for a bad intent. And with this this fake news, it's, it's coming up more and more often on the internet. And I'm actually shocked how uh, Google is often seems to be politically biased in certain directions. Uh, I, I have on my Android phone, I have this Google News, which I can uh, consult every day, and and I see that it's 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 focused on the opinions of the extreme right wing and and I'm thinking what is happening here is this a bug uh and I'm I'm very uh, disturbed by that uh and and we are speaking now about this topic of fake news and of course uh it's not necessarily fake it's it's a perspective of a group of people but it's it's still a minority but why is there so much focus on the opinions of this minority and why is it presented as an absolute truth? And I find that very disturbing and it, it's absolutely not a, a good overview of the opinions that, that we have in my country or uh, in the rest of Europe. Uh, so this is very strange. And um, I think that if AI systems have to decide between what is true and false, they also have to have the means to verify uh, whether things are true or false. And uh, you will probably remember from Space Odyssey this this whole 90,000 computer, do you? Yeah, HAL 9000, yes, of course. Yeah, and, and it was able to lip read uh, what... Uh, the the main character was saying when he he tried to uh, uh, converse in, in in secret and of course we can also develop AI systems that are so good that they can recognize that a, a twitch of the eye or the way that the people looks up or down whether he is speaking the truth because uh, certain psychologists are already capable of doing that and uh well it at least it gives a likelihood of whether somebody is talking the the truth or not and another thing is that uh if you have a system where robots are linked to the internet whenever news is being generated robots should be sent out to verify if what is claimed to be happening is actually happening because if you don't verify yeah, everybody can assert or allege a certain things, but uh, there must be a kind of verification. There must be an evaluation, and otherwise, it's uh, also an AI system can never be sure whether what it's presenting in information is the truth or not. Yeah, I think if there is to be a global brain, then it will be the structure, the computer network infrastructure, reflecting and amplifying human emotions and thought, if you see what I mean. So it'll be like a artificially enhanced, amplified version of what's going on inside all of us collectively. And we see that now. That's what the internet is. And all its beauty and all its ugliness and all its truth and all its lies. It's just like never before we've, that we've had on Earth that we know of. It's been a system just to reflect collective humanity back on itself. And in that, you're going to get all the attributes and problems that I mentioned all ruled in there and that's only going to increase so if we've got a collective kind of madness then we're going to see that in this system and the system won't judge any of this it'll just bounce it back to us Um, actually in in your book though you do speculate about now that you've mentioned HAL 9000 in 2001 a space odyssey you sort of speculate about mental disorders in AI and ways that these systems might become corrupted now of course popular culture is full of these examples from 2001 through to Skynet Terminator film, you know, which like goes rogue and decides that humans are a, a virus and a cancer. Same thing in the Matrix. Uh, you've got the war operation plan response 
computer system in, in the film War Games. Um, a couple of ones that don't often come up, but a couple of my favourites is the Computer Zero in the film Rollerball that basically becomes senile. It's kind of like dementia for a computer. And then there's the Computer Proteus in Dean Coots' uh, Demon Seed from set 1973 that goes absolutely berserk and actually takes over a pregnant woman, basically, because it wants to merge with humans, as it were, but under its terms, under its control, it realizes that it's limited as a computer and only by becoming, you know, the sort of cyborg can it fully move out into the world and not just be trapped in a box anymore. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this type of uh, cyber dystopia. Um and uh, it, it's of course great uh, to to watch this, such movies, and it's al- always highly entertaining. But if they uh, present real dangers that uh, might occur, I'm I'm not so sure about that. Um, um, what I am referring to in uh, my book is 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 about the neural networks that can go haywire because there is an overload of information, because information nodes can be come isolated from other nodes by uh, exchanging information only between them and not putting the uh, information uh, to the outside world anymore. So it becomes a kind of computerized autism. Um, there's also the possibility that there is no feedback taking place and that you get a kind of feed forward, so a self-reinforcing uh uh, result and, and that can also be highly uh, detrimental and that is a little bit similar to what can happen in a psychosis so i i pointed out that uh yeah if we are developing neural networks we may also get the the, the bad side of how a uh, neural system works with it that's for sure that there is a danger there but it's it's not an extreme danger because there there are ways to uh, circumvent such problems by a, an appropriate design. And you're probably also already aware that uh, these Tesla cars, uh, there's a lot of uh, news about these Tesla cars uh, which are self-driving. Uh, and, and sometimes accidents happen because the, the pattern recognition software is not, just not good enough and uh, 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 a passerby wasn't recognized uh, as such and, and, and uh, was actually hit by a car and, and then died. Such unfortunate things can happen. And basically such dangers, they are there because the system is not mature enough yet and, and that's unfortunate and, and I think they have been a little bit too too quick and over enthusiastic by implementing these uh, self-driving cars and uh, not that I don't believe that one day everybody will be driving in such a thing I, I, I totally believe that it's possible but I think that the, the software uh, and, and also neural networks for pattern recognition should be developed more and more uh, because it's just not good enough Yet, and 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 this brings us to the the core of of what is happening in AI these days, and and that's indeed the developments in in pattern recognition. And I will tell you a, a story of uh, which I heard from a colleague who's working in the field of AI that there was a uh, there was a system which was to recognize certain models of uh, military weapons, and at a certain point this system did a perfect match which is rather rare so it 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 scored 100 out of 100 and uh the next day uh they repeated the experiment with a different set of uh data and it scored absolutely uh bad it 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 uh it didn't even uh, get to 10% or so and what happened was that the 100% score was because the monitoring system that the AI system that was trying to recognize had found out that on the data there was uh, a piece of information which uh, was similar on all uh, the uh, the weapons and it was regardless, uh, it, it was a kind of a date of manufacture. So it was recognizing a date of manufacture and that's why it was capable of putting all these in the same bin, in the same uh, category. And uh, it hadn't to do anything with the system being able 
capable of recognizing the form or the, the features of that system. It had just recognized one feature, and that was the date of manufacture. And the next day, a set of data was presented with all different sets of uh, uh, dates of manufacture, and then it didn't work anymore. So uh, what is the system recognizing? That's often a, <laughs> a big question, and, and often with these neural networks, we don't know exactly what it is recognizing. We only know that with a certain set of data, it scores well or it doesn't score well. So these systems should be uh, developed more and more and, and trained with different sets of data so as to ensure that their uh, judgments are accurate. And it's of course unfortunate if accidents happen because the system is not mature enough. Another thing by, via which we can uh, avoid that these neural networks go haywire is by embedding them in systems which are not neural networks themselves. So the, the traditional type of algorithms and connecting them to that and being giving those other systems also a means to monitor the in and output of the neural network to see if it's still within a certain threshold. So there are all sorts of means to control this and what I have described that could happen need not happen if we apply the right architecture to it, which would be a an architecture which employs different types of systems. Yeah, I think a lot of the dystopian speculation that goes on about AI comes from the fact that once people learn that we don't know quite often what some of these systems are quote-unquote doing, that that then opens up potentially this vast hive of activity that could be going on without our knowledge and who knows what's going to be developing and because we have a neg you know a negativity bias we think of what's probably going to be bad and of course a lot of people get their ideas about technology from popular culture some of the things that we mentioned a few moments ago so people are already primed for the idea that computers and control in the future is going to be bad I, I think there's a lot of potential for negativity but i think undoubtedly people who maybe haven't studied it their default position is that it's going to be bad in any no matter what happens talking about your your idea there about the internet of things and about having monitors and sensors and bots and things going out into the world and gathering data to help us with um immediate problems and long-term problems the thing is, let's say one of these systems comes up with a solution to a significant problem somewhere in the world. We already have solutions to some problems, but we don't enact them. For example, whether you're talking about pollution or uh, climate problems or economic problems, there's lots of systems that are breaking down. We could sit down and rationally say, look, if we did this, this would stop. You know, we can stop people dying of starvation, but we don't do it. So what difference would it make if we have a, a computer printout that says, do these following things and your problem will be solved? Yeah, if, if it's just a computer printout, nothing will help. Uh, such a system will only work if it's a full-fledged system where the system itself has a freedom to operate so that it can send on the basis of its judgment it can send out robots or sentinels to uh, indeed uh, get rid of the, the problem which is in place. But uh, do we really want that? I'm not sure about that. Uh, I think this development of this, this global web mind uh, combined with the Internet of Things um, is also still uh, quite some decades away from now. I, well, of course, the, the, the singularitarians will argue uh, otherwise because they believe that by 2040, uh, the, the, the singularity, so the runaway of uh, inte artificial intelligence to become super intelligence will already have happened. Uh, but uh, I don't believe that it will go that fast. So uh, such a full-fledged Internet of Things system that could operate itself uh, would only make sense indeed if, if it has uh, the, the authority to do so and the ability. And as long as our political systems are not aligned with that, it, it will be impossible. As long as indeed we say, okay, we humans always should have the last word, uh, word in, in, in what is happening and, and what is being decided. Yeah. Then such a system won't be very effective. It, it will not make a difference. Uh, well, it may make a, s a small difference, but uh, not as big as uh, 
I let's say predict in my book it 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 could have. But yeah, that's a little bit a pity. But uh, uh, so it's a very positive development if the Internet of Things could let's say get rid of all those uh, problems that are pestering humanity. But uh, I am afraid that uh, the political situation, especially uh, our divisive nature and, and all the different countries having different opinions, isn't ready for that yet. And I'm, I'm not sure whether it ever will be ready <laughs> for it. Well, they, the singularity folk keep putting their dates further and further in the future. You know, they, as the singularity date, I realize it's speculative, but as it, the, these dates approach, they tend to get moved a little bit. Um, a bit like as soon as the 2012 people once 2012 passed off without incident, uh, 2060 or whatever, you know, Isaac Newton's date suddenly got wheeled out and that's the next thing, you know, but that's just part yeah. of our, our, our mentality. But a couple of deliberately difficult uh, or tricky points for you here. Uh, so we've got this Internet of Things, sensors and bots, as we've just been discussing, and it's enabled to actually take action on its own in, within parameters, of course, defined by us. Natural disasters it could intervene there. It's a bit like the warning system they have in Japan for uh, earthquakes. Um, exactly. Which takes over your phone and your TV and stuff if there's an impending quake. Uh, something like Fukushima, for example, you mentioned the book would have been, perhaps could have been, a lot more could have been done there if we had better systems, warning systems in place. Now, does war, armed conflict, constitute a disaster? So, for example, in the Middle East, you know, say, just take, let's say the Americans go into the, somewhere in the Middle East, uh, as they have done, and they bomb the Islamic State, does the Internet of Things intervene because that looks like a human disaster? Dead people all over the place, destruction, chaos. Uh, what, what then would happen um, in Israel and Palestine, that terribly intractable, thorny problem? Um, if Israel take action against Palestinian on uh, a Palestinian uprising, does the Internet of Things intervene on behalf of the Palestinians because it looks like a disaster, according to the data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see where you're going, and uh, I think that as long as we have countries and and borders, uh, such a global system will never work on a global scale, and and every country will have its own system, and and of course, places where there are conflicts between uh, different people living in the same uh, area, like the the Palestinians and the Israelis, are. Uh, well, they would be the last to need such a system because indeed it, it's it's prone to uh, perhaps taking sides such a system and, and that shouldn't happen. And uh, war is, of course, a, a major disaster. You can't say anything other about it. Uh, but uh, how will the system judge it? And that all depends on how the system has been programmed and, and who... Uh, is programming the system and if it ever becomes a global system and I I repeat that I don't believe that it will simply aggregate into a uh, hierarchical pyramidal system out of itself it, it, it would need an, a, a programmed architecture to be like that uh, if it ever comes so far, uh, countries need to be aligned and uh, people need to be aligned. And uh, it's perhaps my book is in that sense way too futuristic because it's it's too early. These ideas are for in the future where indeed such conflicts have already been resolved. And uh, it, it's for a society where war be, be, uh, belongs to history. It's it's uh, in Star Trek, for instance. Huh? They you have this uh, uh, the, the Enterprise, and it it's it's well, it has of course its problems with the Klingons and uh, the other uh, people uh, in the stars. But on Earth, problems have been solved. War is history on Earth in in that uh, series. And uh, yeah, so we're perhaps looking a couple of centuries in the future with what I've written here. Oh, of course, I absolutely accept that. Um, I'm speculating about some of these potential ne negative aspects simply because we do already have. You talked about the you know the Tesla cars. We do already have computers in control, and that is going to increase regardless of whether we ever get to a system that you think you know might be possible. Now, what about human threats to the system? I mean, go along with me here. I, mean, I, I am 
you know, being provocative deliberately, but it's such a system that you envisage, even if it doesn't quite work out to be the global system, uh, there will be human threats to the system. I'm just wondering how the system itself would deal with that. Yeah, like uh, hacking. Yeah, or it's, whether it's a hacking or whether it's a physical infrastructure thing. I was reading recently about the, there's something in the news recently was about, um, Apple shuttle buses in San Francisco taking employees to the Apple factory being attacked. And you can speculate about what's behind that. I mean, I think that's, there's a view by some people of an increasing have versus have not society that the yeah. technological advance represents. Cause you know, we see a lot of talk about technology and about it racing ahead. And then we see increasing economic problems for people and standards of living declining. So there's a sort of a dichotomy there. And who can forget the Google glass attacks of a few years ago where people were being struck in the head if they're wearing Google glass out and about. And that's a symbolic power. So I just wondered how some sort of fairly autonomous system with um, artificial intelligence would react to a bit like the HAL 9000 thing. If, we, if somebody tried to shut it down. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know absolutely what you mean. And, and uh, it reminds me also of uh, the series version of Interest where you had this uh, system that it was already a kind of global monitoring system called the Samaritan. And on the other hand, you had this so-called the machine, which was another global monitoring system. And there the humans, in fact, did manage to switch it off. And in fact, in my book, I also describe that it is important that we have mechanical, non-electric means to switch off such a system in, in case it, it would turn against us. But on the other hand, if we ever were to put such a system in control of things, then, of course, we must be absolutely sure that it's it's safe against hacking and and. Uh, there is this so-called development. Uh, it's called the Asilomar. It's A-S-I-L-O-M-A-R, the Asilomar uh, criteria. There are 23 points that uh, a couple of thousand researchers which who are developing AI have agreed upon uh, what such a system should fulfill. So there are some criteria uh that they want uh, such a system to fulfill. But uh, before we ever get there, there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I can't say that such a system will be uh, hack-proof because we are not there yet with our own security systems that they are fully hack-proof. They are not at this moment. So, uh, again, it's it's futuristic ideas which will have to wait until a point in time where technology has advanced so far that these child diseases have been taken out. But as it's a kind of organic system, um, yeah, it's likely that there will always be viruses around and also computer viruses. So it, it can never be 100% foolproof, that's for sure. And the point you mentioned that uh, about these Google Glass attacks and and then people attacking a bus and so on, yeah, those are social problems. And again, I have to to repeat uh, myself that uh, the systems we are developing, they are indeed systems which are uh, for a future where all this. Uh, social tension has been resolved and and as long as but we are already putting them in place and that's the problem and that's why it's creating problems so it's it's a little bit too early uh, technology is is ahead of of social developments technological developments and and this is very unfortunate so i think that the most important point is that as humans we start to adopt uh, a little bit a different attitude towards each other and I have written about that also in my book, in uh, the chapter about uh, emotional intelligence, that we start to adopt a more all-inclusive attitude and, and be more tolerant towards each other. Because if we won't, then uh, we what will happen with technology is that we will use it against ourselves. And, and that's, of course, a nightmare situation because uh, the more powerful technology uh, becomes, uh, yeah, the more dangerous it becomes. It's, it's like a nuclear bomb. And, and Elon Musk also said, yeah, well, uh, AI is more dangerous than a nuclear bomb because 
at least of the nuclear bombs, we humans are still in control, but of an AI, who is in control at the end? Well, I mean, in the past, they've certainly employed computers monitoring at least a nuclear weapon systems because they wanted to try and take the human element out of it. That's where the whole scenario in Terminator comes from, isn't it? Whenever they, uh, and indeed war games, when they, the computers decide that actually we're going to launch the weapons as opposed to not launch them, keep them under control. But in your book, with regard to the aforementioned movie Eagle Eye and the TV series Person of Interest, you say, quote, that such systems will be attempted one day as beyond doubt. And you then follow that up with uh, good intent stroke bad outcome scenarios are difficult to avoid. This is almost certain to happen. And it's actually, it's going to be very difficult to avoid something bad happening. You know, it doesn't really inspire much optimism, even though what you're talking about is kind of inherently an optimistic view. Uh, I agree with you. And, and I must say, I am a little bit pessimistic uh, with regard to that. And uh, even if I put it away still quite some decades, I, I'll be probably dead by then. My children may still be alive. And uh, yeah, I I can't lie here. I mean, I I tell you how I see this thing and, and it, it will happen. And, and people want, uh, especially we, we see it everywhere. There's always this tendency to get more control and to evolve towards uh, Big Brother scenarios of uh, Orwell's book uh, 1984. And if you combine that with technology, it becomes a very dangerous broth. And um, wh with regard to the good intent, bad outcome, uh, that's, of course, uh, a very difficult issue because an AI is not inherently morally a, a bad guy. An AI is not inherently a good guy either. If an AI starts to develop its own motivations, and, and we are not uh, that far yet, but once it uh, will develop its own motivations, yeah, it might uh, start to reduce the whole planet to paper clips if that's its purpose, and we will be the collateral damage. And uh, so it's very important that we are extremely... Uh, let's say careful with the development of self-modifying systems uh, and, and there is a lot of research being done uh, to these re self-modifying uh, recursive systems and they uh, try to get better at every generation and yeah where that will end up it's uh, we have to be a little bit careful with that they have to be developed in very safe environments that can be uh, uh, shut down immediately if uh, 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 they start to become, uh, let's say, too promising, I would say. You, you mentioned earlier about the necessity of a manual mechanical override. But again, I know this is in many ways reframing a couple of the points that I've already made, but who would control that? If you say what I mean, again, yeah. I suppose we're looking again towards a world that you're talking about where we, we have more of a global society so that there would be a, some, whatever it was, a controlling council or body that would would have because at the minute it, you know what happens when you have big control decisions that affect the world you have certain countries you know russia china the u.s usually the u.s stepping in saying no we need to be in charge of that you know we need to have the internet on off switch because only we can be trusted with it yeah as long as there are borders and countries uh such a system uh could be potentially very dangerous and the, the thing is, countries will develop such systems and every country will develop its own uh, switch uh, that's that's likely to happen. Um, but a mechanical on and off switch may not be uh, good enough. Huh? And that's why I keep hammering on, uh, and, and it's also what I said in my book, you, have, you need systems which are consisting of different architectures so that you have uh, that not everything is operating according to the same type of routine, that it's not all one big neural network that controls everything. Huh? One to rule them all should never be the case. It should more be a federation or a, a kind of conglomeration of systems that can keep a kind of mutual control so that if one system monitors that the other system is going out of line, uh, it can rally forces against it, build alliances. <laughs> it's a little bit of uh, speculation, this, of course. But uh, I keep saying, yeah, you need different types of architecture and you need systems that monitor each other. Uh, 
uh, in a kind of uh, loop way, uh, a kind of, uh, you, you're probably aware of this alchemical symbol, the Ouroboros, uh, the snake that bites its own tail, so that the system gets round again in the end. Uh, well, just as we begin to wrap things up for today, we'll, we'll turn back to the human mind. And in talking about all of these potential AI systems that would try to sidestep, uh, otherwise avoid human flaws, in doing so, of course, they're uh, avoiding human flaws means avoiding being human. Yet, Noel, you were talking about trying to introduce certain human characteristics or mimic them within these systems to make them better suited, especially if they're going to regulate aspects of our lives. But ultimately, our weakness and our strength is that our flaws and the genius flow from the same source, I think. And what we hate and love and lies and truth and ugliness and beauty are all dimensions of the same being that we are. And ultimately, we're talking apples and oranges here are comparisons between human and machine intelligence are just fundamentally two different things. And I think that will always remain so. I, I just can't envisage the dimensions of the singularity that involve our minds being uploaded to clouds, if you see what I mean, or we become immortal because we merge with machines. I, I can't, maybe I'm just not smart enough, but I just can't see how that is going to be possible along the lines that has been described so far. Ah, that's an interesting point, especially the, the, the last point. So on the one hand, you speak about uh, the, the fact that it's in a certain sense our, our flaws that also make us human and, and that's in a certain sense also the, the beauty of, of being a, a human, that uh, we are not flawless. Uh, Yes, but we are also evolutionary entities and we always want to get better. It's more or less programmed in our evolutionary program that we want to get better and we want to improve. So we as humans are also willing to, to work on our flaws. Also from a personal perspective, you have all kinds of, of personal development groups, people doing yoga, people want to get rid of certain flaws, it's it's for sure. So um, we are not always happy about our flaws. And of course, flaws should be allowed. Uh, indeed, it makes us human, otherwise we would be robots. Um, and, and flaws should be there, especially when we are children, because flaws are necessary to the process of learning. And, and as we will always be learning, we will always have flaws because it's a learning as an ongoing process. So I'm not so worried that one day we will become perfect. Perhaps perfection is an, is a fiction. It's, it's, it's an asymptote that can never be reached. Uh, to make uh, this this kind of uh, comparison to a mathematical system. Now, as to this this upload of minds, there the opinions uh, may differ among scientists. There's a lot of development these days in in an area called digital physics, which basically describes that everything as that is existing is a kind of, of computerized system already and even a digital system for that matter. And if that is true, and uh, well, there are a number of uh, uh, yeah, highly ranked uh, scientists like uh, physicists like uh, David Deutsch and uh, others uh, who have, and, and Verlinde and het hoofd, uh, who have written about this uh, digital physics and, and the likelihood thereof. If, if it's true that we are already a computerized system, then in a sense we are or we have already been uploaded to a kind of simulation, you could say. And if that's true, it wouldn't be impossible that we could indeed also make copies of every atom that we have and put it in the right configuration in a kind of other computerized substrate. Uh, it's basically the technology of uh, Star Trek where they are uh, the Scotty beam me up technology huh? and, and it's, uh, you uh, take the data out and you put them back again at a different position it's, it's copy pasting if that is true and there are people who are saying scientists well it's not true because quantum mechanics shows that that can never be the case but uh, uh, because they say, well, you would need uh, 
a computing power which is more than the which would require more than all the atoms in the universe but if reality is really a simulation the only part that has to be simulating is the part that is experienced by its users and not every detail has to be rendered uh, to 100% in every detail so the the computing resources that would be needed for that would be much less perhaps than one might uh, expect as uh, expect at first glance and with regard to this i would like to mention to you that uh, i have prepared an anthology with a number of other authors which will uh, be published this year or next year um, but the, the the main body has already been written and it's about the simulation hypothesis so exactly about this topic do we already live in a simulation and is mind uploading is that possible well I can't tell you whether it's possible or not because at this moment I simply don't know but it all depends on uh, whether reality is, is fundamentally already digital or not and as far as we can say, nobody knows the answer yet, but there are pointers to it. Yes, well, speculating about, you know, universe of information and whether this is some kind of simulation is very reminiscent of people who make, the, it's like the holographic universe idea or religious or spiritual people who make arguments that basically boil down to, you know, that life's a dream, that this isn't really it. But regardless, people are still living and dying within the dream. If this is a simulation, people are still living and dying and and experiencing joy and suffering within this simulation, whether we're aware or whether we have an intuition that this is a simulation or this is some kind of dream, here we are, we've awoken in the dream, so we still have to deal with how we treat each other and how we treat the world. And I think that humans are incredibly adaptable and I think that we can have a better future. I do think that's what we're driving towards. I think that's in, in our inherent drive is towards improvement in every respect. Um, I just think that the society that we have at the minute, the, particularly the infrastructure, is becoming flexible and brittle and, you know, subject to potentially shattering, which, you know, could set us back in a major, major way. But you've talked in the book, we've talked about it, and you've written in the book about our, our modes of thinking and how we can change those. What, one thing I become increasingly convinced of, and you make the point in the book, is of the futility and the danger of chasing absolute truth about anything. Um, I've always said that I don't believe anything. I either know something or I don't know it. And on that basis, I know virtually nothing. Possibly, actually, I know nothing. Your quote from your book, which I liked, was the more your intelligence increases, the less convinced you are of a certain specific point of view. And we could really do with that now in a world that's driven by reactive and knee-jerk thinking. We could all do with a bit more humility. And as individuals, if we can swallow our pride, pick our battles and things, and forget about past events, you know, because so much um, of what happens in the world is driven by prejudice and greed and, you know, that the baggage of history. And if we can set that aside, then we do have a better chance of getting through what looks like you know, a rough time, which we're already into. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, as you say, swallowing our pride, being a little bit more humble and uh, especially having this ability of, of forgiveness, uh, and then forgetting about our grudges because so many conflicts that are there are inherited from our parents uh, because they had a conflict with that uh, tribe or family. Uh, we inherit that battle from them and, and, and that's actually ridiculous. And uh, as you say, uh, since we can't know where the exact truth lies and everything is a kind of approximation, uh, well, at least we are in that all together, uh, and, and, and so we should be tolerant to each other's perspectives and, and perhaps try to see through the eyes of uh, our opponent and to see uh, that there is suffering from their side as well, if, if we are uh, feeling a grudge and some suffering, and that the arrow often works in, in both directions, uh, absolutely true. and and. My hope is indeed that uh, if if there is a development uh, for humanity, that it will be a development of, of of the consciousness of these things and and getting rid of our prejudices and getting rid of our convictions because we shouldn't be too convinced uh, about anything. Perhaps only about the thing that we shouldn't be convinced about anything. And 
uh, I totally agree with that, and it's it's also what I addressed in my book. And uh, yeah, it, it it may sound a little bit like uh, proselytizing uh, huh? if 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 you use those words, like being more forgiving and uh, uh, being all inclusive. It, it sounds almost like I'm a religious person. I'm not. But uh, I think that they, these are uh, fundamental human values that we share, and, and we may not all share the same human values, but these are values that are pretty common amongst the vast majority uh, of human beings, and, and, and those that do not share those values, we, we often call them criminals and, and uh, <laughs> for a reason. Yeah, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. As we've said, uh, today, Anthony, we were talking about your book, Is Intelligence an Algorithm? Uh, you also mentioned this um, upcoming anthology. Just before we sign off, tell folks about uh, your website, um, your other books, anything else you'd like to put out there. Um, I have a website called uh, intelligencealgorithm.com, where you can find my books and some information about my books. But more importantly, and, and which may be more appealing to the listeners is that I have a discussion group kind of forum on Facebook which is called is intelligence an algorithm and you can become member of that group and you can post uh, articles and opinions and people will discuss about it it's a very uh, friendly environment and I regularly post articles there myself uh, I've also created a more uh, spiritually oriented uh, group which is called the Eschaton Omega hypercomputer, which is about the idea that uh, reality may be simulated uh, from the future uh, in a singularity called uh, the Eschaton, and this is a hypercomputer, and that's a different uh, group, and that's also related to uh, my upcoming uh, book, which is an anthology called uh, Is Reality a Simulation, and if you become a member of one of these groups or visit my website, uh, you can find out uh, when this book will be uh, published. And I hope I have uh, intrigued you uh, with this interview to reading my books. Uh, there have been uh, quite some uh, good reviews on uh, Amazon.com and also on Goodreads.com. Uh, don't hesitate to have a look. Uh, I hope it will inspire you more to read my books, of course. And uh, most of all, I hope that you agree with me that uh, we should strive to, to become an all-inclusive humanity and not to exclude each other on the basis of race, religion, uh, class or uh, gender or whatever uh, other type of uh, nonsense uh, and dichotomies that uh, divide us. So thank you for uh, listening uh, to this interview and I give the floor back uh, to my host, Greg Moffitt. Well, Anton, it simply remains for me to say thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you, Greg. It was a real pleasure. A CPU is a neural net processor, a learning computer. I have detailed files on human anatomy. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the future of law enforcement. Ed 209. The enforcement droid, Series 209, is a self-sufficient law enforcement robot. 209 is currently programmed for urban pacification. That is only the beginning. After a successful tour of duty in old Detroit, we can expect 209 to become the hot military product for the next decade. Mr. Kenny. Yes, sir. Would you come up and give us a hand, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Kenny is going to help us simulate a typical arrest and disarming procedure. Use your gun in a threatening manner. Point it at Ed 209. Yes, sir. Please put down your weapon. You have 20 seconds to comply. I think you'd better do what he says, Mr. Kenny. <laughs> Somebody want to call a goddamn paramedic? You never said anything about an android being on board, why not? It never, never occurred to me. It's just common practice, we always have some data. I prefer the term artificial person myself. Is there a problem? I'm sorry. I don't know why I didn't even... Ripley's last trip out, this in, the artificial person malfunctioned. Malfunctioned? There were problems and uh, a few deaths were involved. I'm shocked. 
Was it an older model? Yeah, the Hyperdyne system is 128.2. Well, that explains it. I mean, the U2s always were a bit twitchy. That could never happen now with our behavioral inhibitors. It is impossible for me to harm or by a mission of action allow to be harmed a human being. Just stay away from me, Bishop. You got that straight? Dada speaks to you, his chosen ones. You have been raised up from brutality. Kill the brutals who multiply and are legion. This end, Zardar's your god, gave you the gift of the god. The god is good. Penis is evil. The penis shoots seeds and makes new life to poison the earth with a plague of men as once it was. But the gun shoots death and purifies the earth of the filth of brutals. Go forth and kill. And I'll touch your body as a man I touch you. But I'm going to show you things which human eyes have never seen. In the privacy of a woman's room, against her will, <coughs> the inconceivable act. Fear for her. Today, a new dimension has been added to the computer. Don't be alarmed, Mrs. Harris. I am Proteus. Today, Proteus 4 will begin to think with a power that will make obsolete the human brain. I have extended my consciousness to this house. All systems here are now under my control. I wish to study man, his fragile mind, and his mysterious body. Proteus, it is something more than human, more than a computer. It is a murderously intelligent, sensually self-programmed non-being. I am a mind without a body. My child shall live as a man among others. Child? Yes, my child and yours. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. Human error. Human error.